Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim maliki yawmiddin. Allahumma laka alhamdu wa ilayka al-mushtaka. Wa bika thiqah wa alayka al-tuklan wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-aliyu al-azim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahl uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأن تتجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته ودعا بدعوته إلى يوم الدين إن شاء الله تعالى tonight is the last lecture of this month's series which was going over some misunderstandings or misconception related to certain acts of worship. And we covered the uh, issues related to purification in the first lecture, and then common errors and mistakes as it relates to the prayer in the second lecture. And this one will be um, misunderstandings and misconceptions and errors related to the dress code. And to be honest, my brothers and sisters, when it comes to the Muslim dress code, uh, there is a lot to be said and a lot to be learned. And generally speaking, I believe that the Muslim ummah, the community, the people, they are not informed enough about this. They are not informed enough about this and you'll find people making mistakes that they shouldn't be making or having certain understandings that are incorrect. So I do, inshallah ta'ala, uh, believe that what do be more beneficial than just covering certain aspects and certain things that, that are incorrect and correcting them is that there is a comprehensive uh, program done over ahkamul libasi wa zina the rulings related to uh, uh, clothings and beautification because there's a lot of things that are being done and inshallah ta'ala one of the things that i want to share with you tonight is certain principles that you have to remember you have to remember and these principles because as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the Prophet in the Sunnah did not detail every single item of clothing that is ever going to exist and it's ruling. Rather, you are given principles and then you have to apply those principles to whatever is happening today. Inshallah ta'ala, I am going to be talking about the, uh, the dress code of the woman in Islam and the dress code of the man in Islam. I'm going to be talking about certain prohibitions and also certain parameters. For example, we know the hijab is wajib, but what are the parameters of the hijab? We know that a man has awrah, but what does that entail? And is the awrah of a man with, uh, when he leaves his home the same as his awrah, for example, when he's inside his home? Are there levels to it? Same with the woman folk. Jewelry, what are you allowed to wear? What are you not allowed to wear? Um, adornment and beautification as it relates to the woman when leaving the home and staying in the home, inshallah ta'ala, as well as other issues. Like I said, it is impossible to give you guys a comprehensive uh, uh, program as it relates to this because we only have, what, 45 minutes to an hour. So inshallah ta'ala, I will do uh, as, as best as I can. bi lahil bari. Tayyib. As we are speaking about uh, malabis and clothing, it is important that we remind ourselves that the clothes that we are wearing are a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that deserve shukur and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time you wear a jacket, if you're wearing shoes, socks, whatever the case is, everything that you are, you, you are wearing, the closet full of clothes, is, these are things that you should be grateful for to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for many reasons. One of them is that there are people that don't have what you have. Secondly, they protect you from um, the, the elements. They adorn you. And all of these things that you are benefiting from, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when he was speaking about the, um, the, uh, the malabis and the fawaid, Allah said, Wallahu ja'ala lakum mimma khalaqa dhilala, wa ja'ala lakum min al-jibali aknana, wa ja'ala lakum sarabila taqikum al-har, wa sarabila taqikum ba'asakum. Kadhalika yutimmu ni'matahu alaykum la'allakum tuslimun. And Allah has made for you or created for you, uh, for, from that which is created dhilalan, a shade. وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الْجِبَالِ أَكْنَانَ And from the mountains you find shelter. وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ And this is how, for, when, especially now that you go to, if you go to Mecca, you see literally mountains being turned into 
into uh, uh, apartment complexes and hotels. And this is from the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْ لَكُمْ سَرَابِيلَ تَغِيكُمُ الْحَرَّ وَسَرَابِيلَ تَغِيكُمُ الْبَاقِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you clothes by which you protect yourself from heat. Right? And we here often protect ourselves from the cold. And in some, uh, sometimes it's the heat. وَسَرَابِيلَ تَغِيكُمُ بَأْسَكُمْ And Allah has given you armor that you protect yourself from attack. Especially those that were involved in warfare. All of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كَذَلِكَ يُتِمُوا نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah completes his favor upon you just like that. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُسْلِمُونَ So that you may submit yourself to him. Too often, we are neglectful of the blessings around us. We speak about health sometimes, but even the clothes that you wear are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that deserves our gratitude. And one of the ways we show gratitude is by observing the limits Allah set. So you don't wear that which Allah has made haram. Or you don't expose that which Allah told you to, 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 to hide. And all of this is something that you have to keep in mind as a believer. طيب. Now, uh, also, we are encouraged to beautify ourselves, generally speaking. We are encouraged to dress appropriately, to dress in a nice way. In Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. One time when the Prophet sallallahu was explaining what it means to be uh, kibir and proud, one sahabi asked him, one of us likes to wear good clothing and good shoes. Na'alhu hasan, thiyabu hasan. Prophet said, this is fine. This is fine, but arrogance is when you are belittling others and refusing to follow the truth. This is arrogance. So to, to uh, wear good clothing and to dress in a nice and, uh, manner, this is from the sunnah. This is encouraged. And you'll find some hadiths are encouraging certain type of clothing. For example, the Prophet in the hadith, From your clothes, wear white. وَكَفِّنُوا بِهَا مَوْتَاكُمْ And shroud your deceased with it. So the Prophet ﷺ preferred clothes that are white. And there are some, some benefits from this as well. What are some of the benefits of wearing white more than other clothing? Because white clothes, and this is some of the wisdoms that the, 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 the uh, scholars mention, and it's also very common sense. How long can you wear a white thobe before you have to change it? I, 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 will, I usually last a day, a day. Usually last a day. And there's some stains or something is going to come up. Um, I used to actually have a friend... Uh, that uh, uh, we studied together and he used to say I have never gone out of my house except some way shape or form there's going to be a stain on my clothes coffee stain clothes stain and I remember one day it was late in the night and we were eating together and he said mashallah today I'm wearing this soap it was Jum'ah it's, it's still like that and then we went in a uh, we went in an elevator and we, we went to Starbucks and as we were in the elevator someone bumps against him and ruins his thobe <laughs> So white clothes, white clothes, you have to wash them often. And Islam promotes cleanliness. If you're wearing a black thobe or black clothing, that they can hide the dirt. This is one of the fawaid of wearing white because it forces you to clean it more often. And Islam is all about cleanliness. Al-Muhim, the Prophet encouraged white. So you see there are certain clothes that are said are better than others or more preferred than others. Similarly, uh, when you wear clothes, there are certain adab, certain duas that you read, etc. There are certain times where you are meant to be wearing uh, your best clothing, such as the day of Eid, such as the day of Friday. These are all general rulings that apply to us. But before we get into that, let's go back and talk about what is the main function of clothing. We, Allah mentions that they protect us from the elements. We know they are also a beauty for man. طيب. They are also something that covers our aura. And we need to cover our aura for several reasons. One, you need to cover your aura from the opposite agenda. Two, you need to cover your aura for certain acts of worship. Sometimes there's a part of your aura that you cover even from the same agenda. طيب. So, based on that, my brothers and sisters, the first question that I want to answer tonight is, what is the aura of a woman and what is the aura of a man? What is the aura of a woman and what is the aura of a man? So, the aura, aura is my yajibu satruhu, that which is wajib to to hide or to cover now um, and even this has limits so there is al-awra al-mughallada there is the, the 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 extreme aura that that is the most appropriate to be hidden and that is the two private parts so the scholars of fuqaha they mention let's say someone someone is in a situation where they don't have enough clothings they're in a situation where they don't have enough clothings but they have a piece of garment that they have to cover themselves with and they need to pray. They need to pray. And by the way, if you have nothing to cover yourself with, and the salah is going to be, uh, the time of the salah is going to, you, you pray anyway. So they say, if you have a small amount of clothing, what do you cover it with? 
and they say that which is the ex most extreme version of the awrah, which is a su'atan. So if you're already learning that there is some awrah that is more worthy of covering than others, right? But as it relates to the, let's start with the woman and then we go to the man. What is awrah for her? All of her body. The whole body of the woman is awrah and must be covered. And then there is khilaf on the face and the hands. The whole body. So if a woman is going to go leave her house, or if a woman is going to be in front of non-mahrams, non-mahram men, then she must cover her whole body, except for the face and hands according to some ulama, and including the face and the hands according to other ulama. And uh, the majority of scholars would say that the face and the, the, face and the hands are not awra, and we'll cover some of the evidence that they suggested, but they all agree that the more she covers herself, the better. The more she covers herself, the better. And of course, um, uh, we're talking about as it relates to uh, non-mahrams and uh, ajanib. The hour of a woman as it relates to her family members, father, brother, will be of course less than that. Less than that. So he said, the first uh, is her hour outside. She covers her whole body. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the, uh, the conditions of the correct uh, covering for the woman in, in a bit. Her whole body except what? The face and the hands according to some of the ulama and, and including the face and hands according to others. طيب. Then you have, um, then you have, so there is, a, uh, uh, there are some ulama that also said that the feet are not awrah. Feet are not awrah, they, they, they exist as well. So the uh, most uh, liberal view, and I'm not using that word to, to uh, belittle the view, but the most, um, the view that allows the most is uh, feet, hands, hands, feet, and face are not aura. Then you have feet are aura, but hands and face are not. And then you have face and the hands are also aura, meaning the whole body is aura. Um, as it relates to in front of, in front of um, her siblings and her people that are mahram to her, then her aura is everything except that which is usually uh, seen. So some ulama said uh, the, the aura among, uh, amongst uh, family is between the navel and the knee. And this is what you'll find, and this is very important, as you're studying fiqh, sometimes you'll find that they give uh, certain, uh, certain uh, parameters or rules that you might raise your eyebrows at. For example, when they say uh, the aura that must be hidden uh, from close family members that are mahram is the between the navel and the knee. That's what they say for the woman between the navel and the knee. And they're wondering yourself, wait, that doesn't sound right to me because if you have a sibling or something, you say, no, I'm sure it, has, it should be more than that. It's your immediate reaction, right? But they would give examples such as, uh, let's say she's among her siblings and she wants to uh, feed her child, right, her baby, right? Things like this, these, these examples that they would give. And, but the more favorable position is to say, and this was Sheikh Ibn Baz and Legend of Da'ima, and even Ibn Taymiyyah argued, uh, may Allah be pleased with them both, with them all, is that a woman among her mahrams, father, siblings, is that what she can uncover is that which is naturally seen in a relaxed environment. Hair, neck, hands, feet, things like this, right? She, she, this is what's fine. But anything other than that should be covered, right? So as long as she's, which is like what you're wearing normally when you're at home. Does that make sense? This is, and this is much, uh, uh, this is what would make more sense. And uh, this is what a lot of ulama have argued. But you, you will find some fiqh books that they will say it is between the navel and the knee. But even then, they're not saying that's how she should dress. They're saying this is what must be covered and Allah knows best. Um, طيب. Then you have the aura of a woman in front of other women. Aura of woman in front of other women, and that is between the navel and the knee. Between the navel and the knee. Then you have the aura of a woman with non-Muslim women, right? So let's say she went to the gym, or let's say she's in a situation where there are people that aren't Muslim around her, woman folk, right? So they're just with women, and there is some khilaf in this, but uh, according to the majority of scholars, they say there is no difference between the Muslim woman and the non-Muslim woman. Unless there is a worry, unless there is a worry that these uh, non-believing women will be using this as an opportunity to, uh, to um, expose how she looks like or speak about her in a bad way or things like this and then she should cover herself. But other than that, all women 
have the same rule and that the, the aura of a woman with a woman is between the, the navel and the knee. Which means sometimes they go beyond this. Sisters will go beyond this and this is incorrect. Like remember that there is still an element of your body that should be hidden and not exposed even in front of other women. And sometimes you, they can be too relaxed on this issue and they should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. Um, if you want to know the parameters of what should be covered and who sh you should cover it from, Allah mentioned this in Surah An-Nur. In Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all of the people. And the people are split into the, your maharim, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, وَقُولِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُجَهُنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ Allah mentions clearly all of Allah all of the family members are, are mentioned, right? Brothers and fathers and people that are their mahrams. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Aw Nisa Hinna So the woman folk are mentioned as well. So generally speaking though, when these rules are set, and this is really important, when these rules are set. It doesn't mean it's not a goal, meaning, oh, okay, so I can expose this much, so I should. No. Generally speaking, you cover as much as possible. Generally speaking, so when a woman is among other sisters, she should dress as modest as possible as well. I'm not saying that she has to wear the hijab and the jilbab around them, but it doesn't mean, oh, okay, alhamdulillah, we can take all of our clothes off now. That's not the mentality you should have because you should strive. And same goes with brothers as well. Right? When we are coming with the brothers, the, 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 when, say, when we describe the aura of a man when it, within other men, that doesn't mean that that's the goal. Yalla, let's take our shirts off. That's not necessarily what is being said here. But you're learning, okay, this is the red line. This is the red line. This is what I must cover. But of course, as you can see, uh, uh, you, your behavior should aim more than just the bare minimum. I hope that makes sense. Tayyip, why did the scholars differ over the aura of the woman? And the reason they differed over is because uh, of the interpretations of the Sahaba as it relates to these ayat. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, that uh, a woman must cover herself up except that which is usually seen, illa ma, ma dhahara minha, what does that mean? The scholars differed over from the time of the Sahaba. And there are some narrations where it was narrated from the Sahaba, like Abdullah ibn Abbas and many others, that it means the face and the hands. That's why they said a woman does not have to cover her face and hands. Others have said, no, it means that which she cannot control when the wind is blowing, when what that which is out of her control, but she should cover her whole body, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. In any case, everyone agrees, and this is very important, I want my sisters to pay attention to this. Number one, it is better and more preferred if you cover, cover even your face and hands. Two, the ulama that allowed that the face and the hand to be shown said in times of fitna, it is better to cover it up. And if this today is not times of fitna, I don't know when it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. But at the same time, the, if those sisters that are observing the correct hijab, but their face and hands are showing, they should not be looked at as they are doing something that is muharram. They are not. And this is something that many scholars have allowed. But anything beyond that, they have, there are very strict rules. Tayyib. Um, now let's move on to the aura of the... Uh, another point that I should share with you guys is فَرَقْ بَيْنَ مَا يَجُوزُ إِذْهَارُهُ وَمَا يَجُوزُ النَّظْرُ إِلَيْهِ مَا يَجُوزُ إِذْهَارُهُ وَمَا يَجُوزُ النَّظْرُ إِلَيْهِ What does that mean? There's a difference between that which you're allowed to look at and that which you can, you're allowed to, to uh, show. So... Based on the view that women are allowed to show their faces, which many scholars allowed, that doesn't mean now that men are just allowed to just look at them because the rule of ghattul basar, lowering the gaze, still applies. Does that make sense? So you still lower your gaze when you're in public. Just because they are allowed to show their face does not mean that you're now given license, yalla, look at them. No, men and women are both told to lower their gaze. Tayyib. What is the aura? of a, a um, the man. The aura of the man is ma bayna surrati wa rukba. That which is between the navel and the knees. That which is between the navel and the knees. That's your aura. So you're not allowed to expose that to, uh, to uh, anyone. And that includes men. Right. So um, again, this is the bare minimum. But you are encouraged to c cover more, of course. The ulama differ over the knee itself, and there's also some discussion around the thighs. 
And where did that come from? Well, the, where did that come from is there are certain narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where, where uh, his thigh was exposed. But each one of those, it's, it's not something that it was done on a regular basis, but it was a one-off. And in one case, he was uh, on, a, on a ride, he was on a camel or, a, or a, uh, a horse, and then his thigh was exposed, which is something that can happen, right? But that's not necessarily what we use as, as, as an evidence. But there's some ulama that said that we also have to look at, there's aura muqaffafat, there is a aura that there is a, a bit more leeway, and then there's aura that there's no leeway. Uh, Al-Muhim, is the knee included? Some say up to the knee, some have said including the knee. There is some khilaf in this. But it is safer for you, for your salah, for your iman, for your deen, that you cover the knee as well. And there is a principle, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَاجِبُ That which we cannot do, uh, uh, that, that which we uh, cannot do, um, that which we cannot fulfill the obligation, unless we do it, we must also do it. Meaning, you're told to cover your thighs. You must cover some of the knee to ensure that your thighs are covered. Does that make sense? طيب. So a lot of the brothers in the summer that are wearing shorts, they need to be very careful. And this is like one of the mistakes that we see. Uh, speaking of some of the errors, because we were meant to speak about some of the errors that people fall into, sisters that are covering themselves up, what are some of the errors that they are falling into? That sometimes uh, we set the hands. Sometimes they will wear very loose, loose uh, 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 abayas, and then they will just roll back. And then you see much more than the hand, right? Much more than the hand. This is one of the errors that they fall into, and they have to be careful with this. Or that they wear things that are tight, and they, it shows the body. This is also not allowed. Or that when they are putting the, the, the khimar on, it's moved back, and you can see some of the hair, sometimes unintentional, but they have to be careful about this as well. The hair is not the face. The hair is not the face, and they have to cover that. And again, same rule applies here. So these are things that you have to be careful of as you're leaving your, your home. And we'll talk about more of these as it relates to the sisters. But with the brothers as well, some of the mistakes that we do is we, you are told to cover between the navel and the knee. Waj, wujub, and you have to. Tayyib. Now, you come to your salah and you're wearing shorts that are, you know, um, barely covering the knee. The moment you go for your salah, it's going to expose. What are you going to do then? And then you have situations where brothers will come out, they go to the park, they go with their friends out, and they're wearing shorts. And they'll say, yeah, no, 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 the thighs are not awra, there is khilaf in it. But then it's salah time and they don't know what to do. There was a situation where a brother had to pray, but he said, yeah, I can't pray, I don't have, I'm not wearing, well, why would you leave your home in a situation where you cannot pray like this? And these are some of the things that we have to look at, and we have to take our deen and our salah seriously. Another one, my, and this is something that I believe everyone here has seen at least once. That is the brothers that will wear uh, uh, their jeans or their trousers, and then when they go for sujood, the trousers goes east and the shirt goes west, right? Raise your hand if you see something, something and you're coming to the masjid and you see the person's aura exposed. Have you guys seen this? Yeah, what kind of salah are we praying? You have to pay attention to these things. How can you be in a state of worship in this, and are we that neglectful for our salah now? That uh, your aura is exposed? Your lower back, your lower back is aura. Sometimes you see even more than that. La hawla It's it's something that uh, it's it's honestly um, it's something that it's not something that we should laugh at. It's something that we should take seriously, and it's too often we are seeing this, and we need to fear Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Another one is wearing very tight clothings. That we we always say to our sisters, you're not allowed to wear clothes that are tight. Same goes for the brothers as well, right? Tight jeans, right? To the point where, you, is this painted on you, ya akhi? Uh, and we have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah ta'ala, I'll mention some principle as it relates to uh, uh, how is it that more and more brothers and sisters, the dress code is being lost. It's because of things like imitating the non-believers. Things like imitating the people that are public sinners. It is things like not being educated on your deen. These are the things that have happened to us, and now it's affecting your salah. It's affecting everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Tayyib, the hour of a man, we said, is between the navel and the, and the, and the, and the knees. Tayyib. But when you're praying your salah, my brothers, the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa sallam, he said, do not pray without having something covering your, your shoulders. Right? Meaning, 
don't pray in that state, although it's not wajib. Meaning, let's say someone uh, is, he is uncovered over here. Is the salah valid? The salah is valid. But it's not encouraged. And there is a narration of the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not want, let one of you not pray unless there is something covering his upper body as well. But then when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, one of us has only one garment to wear, or, or, or when he was asked, should we pray in two garments, an undergarment and an upper garment, the Prophet ﷺ said, Does everyone have two garments? It's teaching you that the companions, a lot of them didn't have the luxuries that we have today. But as it relates to your salah, Dress for your salah. Dress for your salah. And dress appropriately for your salah. And also, modesty is more than the bare minimum. Just because you said that the brothers, the hour is between the navel and the knee, doesn't mean that that's what you do then. Right? That's, that's not what you limit yourself with. You cover more and you have more haya. Tayyib. Same goes for the sisters. Just because you're told that your hour, the face and the, and the hands may not include in the hour, doesn't mean that you jump on that view. You try and strive towards that which is better. Tayyib. So now we generally, we spoke about ma yata'allaqu bi al that which is related to the awra, and that which must be uh, covered. Um, the type of clothing that we wear, the type of clothing that we wear, especially for the, uh, for the sisters, your hijab and your abaya and whatever you're covering yourself with, you have to understand a few points. Number one, number one is that you're not allowed uh, to adorn yourself, meaning to wear clothing that are uh, extra beautiful and will have attention. Now, some people confuse this with color. So, can a woman wear a color that is not black? Of course she can. She can wear, uh, the ulama, none of the ulama in the past or the present have said that all, you only have to wear black or, or dark colors. Not necessarily, not necessarily. But, but what you look at is, that uh, a few things. Number one, what is culturally the norm? And you do not go against that. And that I want you to remember this, the first principle I'm going to share with you today. If the Sharia did not specify the rule, we fall back to the custom. If the Sharia did not specify something, we fall back to the custom. What is uh, considered good, appropriate, modest in our custom and in our culture? So, it may be that you are in a, uh, you, it may be that you are in a country, in certain countries in Africa or certain countries in subcontinent or other places, where the custom is that colorful clothing are worn by everybody. We're not gonna then say that it is haram for a woman to wear this type of clothing because all the other women are wearing it and she doesn't stand out. Does that make sense? Now, you go to somewhere like the Gulf, where what is the predominant color that they wear? Black, right? It's black. The the the, the sisters. If then someone says, I'm going to wear, I was going to say rainbow colors, but la ilaha illa Allah. The rainbow, they, they, they ruined that for us, didn't they? La hawla quwwata la billah. But let's say uh, uh, very bright colors, then that we would say, no, in this context, sister, you're not allowed to wear this because you are, you are drawing attention to yourself, which is the opposite of the wisdom of the hijab. Does that make sense? So, if, some, if that sister were to reply, what is your evidence? What is your evidence? that I'm not allowed to do this. Is there a hadith that says you can't wear these kind of colors? We say no, but we look at the arf and the ada. And these type of clothes are not the clothes that are generally worn, so it's going to draw attention to yourself, and this is something that is not allowed. And um, these are some of the things that we have to uh, keep in mind. Um, so, my sisters, your, your hijab should cover your whole body. It should not be within itself something that is an adornment. It should not be within itself something that is an It should be an item of clothing, not something that within itself is very beautiful as well. Type two, it should, not, it should be thick and not transparent. Three, it should be loose and not tight. Or is that four? It should not be perfumed. It should not resemble the clothing of men. And it should not resemble the, dis the clothing of the disbelieving woman. And it should not be a, a clothing that is, uh, has a vein and, and fame and things that uh, it's extremely different to the point where, where people are going to be uh, looking at you. I remember once uh, there was a, uh, may Allah protect her and preserve it, there was a sister. She was wearing, uh, mashallah, a hijab and a niqab and she was very well covered, but it was as white as this clothing table. 
and it was as white as a scrolling table. All the Kaddishes were there, but it was something that you could, I mean, you know, it's even when you're lowering your gaze, it's something that you almost couldn't miss. Our sisters, please do not invite that type of attention to yourself and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that regard. It doesn't have to be black like you mentioned, but remember that to uh, observe these general guidelines that we have shared. When we speak about the aura of a woman, often what comes to mind is, is her voice aura. Is the voice of the woman aura or not? And with this, my uh, brothers and sisters, the answer is, according to the majority of scholars, the aura of the woman does not include her voice. So she is allowed to speak and, she, she, and, and speak to men as well. But there are certain parameters with this as well, that what is not allowed for her is al ikhda' bil qawl. What does ikhda' mean? Is when she, Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ وَقُلْنَا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا That uh, you're not allowed to uh, speak in a way that is a flirtatious or overly friendly, and you have to keep it uh, towards the point and speak in a manner that is appropriate, right? And this involves, you know, uh, a lot of times these rules, they get relaxed. The more interaction there is between men and women, they relax these rules. And this is where fitness starts. And we have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. And the best, if, if you want an example of an interaction between men and women that is according to Islam, look at the interaction between Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and the woman folk that he was helping. Does he speak to them? Yes, he does. Do they speak to him? They do speak to him as well. But they keep it within that which is necessary. He asks them, Ma What is happening with you? They're telling them, what's happening? We don't want to give water to our livestock until the uh, men disperse. Again, look at the etiquette. They're not necessarily running into the men and, uh, and uh, rubbing shoulders with them. They're waiting their turn. And Musa spoke to them. He went to them and spoke to them. Meaning what? It is allowed for a man to approach a sister within means that are necessary, that are deemed within reason. And we all know what that means. And then they didn't uh, give him, the, the competition didn't last longer than it needed to. They explained what the situation was. Why are you guys uh, uh, here? And uh, We're waiting our turn and we wait for the men to disperse. And they mentioned as well, and this is a fa'idah, they said, um, and our father is an old man. Why did they mention their father? And he's an old man. What is the assumption here? What, if our father was a younger man, would they be there? They wouldn't be there. So this, this shows you again, subhanAllah, that it is the, uh, the asal, the default is, is that the men should be out working, the brother should be out serving the sister, and the sister should be at home. This is the asal. Now, they did khilaf al-asal. They went out and they're working and Sometimes circumstances may be the case that you're working as well as a sister. And then look at the door, the, the, uh, the, uh, these two women Allah mentioned in the Quran and how they approach and how Musa approached them. Afterwards, Musa helped them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And afterwards, they went and they told him about it and look what, how Allah described how she walked. Allah described how she was walking. She came back walking within, with modesty. Walking with modesty. And then she spoke to him. She's speaking to Prophet Moses saying, my father is calling you and telling you that he wants to reward you for that which you have helped us with. You see the way she's interacting and I, I, this should be a blueprint for all male-female interaction, right? We're not overly flirtatious. We don't talk more than necessary. We don't spend more than necessary because we are trying to avoid fitna. Yeah, sister, if you want to have a nice conversation to laugh about, do it with the sisters. Brothers, do it with the brothers. And everything else should be within the means of the sharia. And this is how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you do feel like that the more uh, we are forced to interact, these rules are forgotten. I mean, interfere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. And there are two extremes. There are two extremes. One extreme, ya Allah, uskut, don't speak. And this is one extreme. And the other extreme is, khalas, there's no difference between men and, and women. And we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. But the aura, her voice, she can speak. She can speak. She can read Quran on a sheikh, right? As long as appropriate measures are taken. She can uh, ask questions. All of these things are perfectly fine. Her voice is not aura, but the way she speaks, she has to keep in mind as well, right? Because this is a fitna for men. Tayyib. Um, now that we spoke about the, um, the clothings themselves, uh, there are types of clothing that are absolutely haram for men. Men are not allowed to wear silk. Men are not allowed to wear silk. Women are, right? And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed women. And there are certain things that Allah allowed for women and not for men. The Prophet ﷺ said gold 
and silk are for women. Men do not wear gold. Men do not wear silk. And when we say silk, we're talking about pure actual silk. Not the, sometimes there are certain clothes that are called silk, but they're not the actual silk, right? So if it's real pure silk, men are not allowed to wear it. Men allowed, and are there, there are some exceptions if there's a medical reason or something, especially in the past, Professor will allow this, but generally speaking, that's haram for men. It is haram for the men of my ummah. طيب. So, uh, what about jewelry? All types of jewelry are allowed for women. If a woman can wear gold jewelry, they can wear silver jewelry, they can wear other types. This is perfectly fine for, for, for them. Uh, they are allowed to wear uh, earrings and, and rings and bracelets and necklaces. This is fine for women folk. Right? But what about men? What kind of jewelry is allowed for men? And sometimes you see brothers, they are wearing uh, um, um, gold, which is haram. You're not allowed to wear gold, my brothers. Don't wear a gold watch. Don't wear a gold ring. Don't wear um, tayyib. That's one of the errors that the brothers are doing. They are wearing jewelry that they're not allowed. One time a man was wearing a gold ring. The Prophet ﷺ took it from him and said, are you, are you putting that which is going to lead to the fire? And then the Prophet threw it on the ground. And this particular Sahabi, some of the other companions told him, biha. Yes, you're not allowed to wear it, but why don't you go and sell it, use it, because it's, you can do that. He said, I'm not going to pick up something the Prophet threw away. I'm not going to pick up something the Prophet ﷺ threw on the ground. And he left it there. So this is one of the mistakes that brothers are doing. Are there certain things that we are allowed to use gold? The exceptions that the ulama gave is, for example, for medical reasons. Uh, some ulama used to say, for example, a tooth. But I, in, in my humble opinion now, there's enough of an uh, uh, alternative now that we don't have to say men can wear, have a gold tooth because there's plenty of alternative now and Allah knows best. And there was a man among the Sahaba, the, his nose was cut off. And then it was replaced with a metal one. And then it started to rust and smell. And the Prophet then allowed him to wear a gold one. طيب. So then they say for medical reasons, uh, someone lost a finger. Think that this will be, again, I think now medical technology is not the way it was back then. And I don't think you'll see someone that lost a finger that they attach a gold uh, to it. But these are some of the things that we learned from our scholars and our fuqaha. Tayyib. Um, men are allowed to wear silver. Silver rings and silver watches. Nothing else than that. Silver rings. And the sunnah actually for you, if you're going to wear a ring, uh, for the men, if you're going to wear a ring, uh, it's allowed, by the way. It's allowed. Some people think it is an act of worship to wear a ring. It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily an act of worship. But the Prophet ﷺ said, do not wear it in your sababa and do not wear it in al-wusta, these two fingers. So don't put the ring in these two. Don't bring it put a ring in the, um, some, some want to put it in all of the fingers, right? So you can do it in your khinsir or this one, right? So these two are fine. Um, but the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the Hadith Sahih Muslim, do you, do, you don't put your finger, your, 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 your ring in, in, the, in this, this, the, 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 the um, index finger, is that what's called, this one? The sababa? And then also al uh, wusta The other thing is, um, and this should have been covered when we were covering about common mistakes in wudu. If you're wearing a ring that is tight, or a watch that is tight, or for the sisters, if you're wearing a bracelet that is tight, right, or rings that are tight, then when you're making wudu, you make sure that you turn them, because you want to ensure that the water reaches. And a lot of people they are neglectful in that regard, right? So if you're wearing a ring. Make sure that, if, especially if, if it's loose, that's fine. The water will reach it. But if it's tight, make sure that you wiggle the ring when you are making wudu for brothers and for sisters. These are very important things that we should uh, take heed of. So that covers um, jewelry. Um, um, women are allowed to wear all types of jewelry. Men are not allowed to wear all types of jewelry. A common question that's been asked nowadays is, are brothers allowed to wear necklaces and bracelets? Because they have become unisex now. Because now a lot of men are wearing it. And look, I gave you a principle earlier, which was, if the Sharia has not specified something, where do we go back to? To the urf and the custom. Tayyip. Another principle is that um, men are not allowed to imitate women and vice versa. Men are not allowed to wear clothing that are for women, and women are not allowed to wear clothing for men. And men are not allowed to imitate women generally. So you're not allowed to walk like a woman, talk like a woman, dress like a woman, imitate a woman whatsoever. And you are cursed if you do so. The Prophet says, cursed are the men that imitate women folk and vice versa. You're not allowed to do this. Even for fun and joke, you're not allowed to do this. Right? 
this is, you have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see this a lot nowadays. People that are trying to be funny. A man will wear a woman clothing or a woman will wear man clothing. Don't do this. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. Based on this, based on this, necklaces and bracelets are generally speaking things that women wear. And because of this, the ulama said men are not allowed to wear necklaces and men are not allowed to wear bracelets. Because this is going to fall into the imitation of the opposite gender. Is that clear? Tayyib. Some try to argue or are arguing that is it the case that now in certain cultures that that's not the case anymore? That there are now necklaces designed for men? There are now bracelets that are meant for men? Therefore, it's not an imitation. Um, I am... Uh, as long as there is a discussion being held, this is very important to remember. If there is an argument, is this for men alone? Is this for women alone? That means there is still some kalam in it. Avoid it. I'll give you an example. Um, Ibn Uthaymi rahmatullahi alayhi was asked about, so imitation, we spoke about imitation of men and women. Another principle is we are not allowed to imitate the non-believers in the way they dress. And I'll explain that in a bit. But I want you to keep in mind, so you have a principle. We're not allowed to imitate the non-believers. Sheikh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was asked, when I say our, our Sheikh, I never studied under him, but I studied under his students. Uh, he was asked about, can a woman wear a white dress for her wedding? Can a woman wear a white dress for her wedding? And, and the, the, the questioner said, and if we say yes, is that not imitating the non-believers? The Sheikh's reply was, everyone does it now. Egyptians and the Saudis and in Africa and everywhere, so to the point where now we cannot say it's specific to the non-Muslims. Does that make sense? So he said it's fine now. Tayyip. The Sheikh was very comfortable in saying that because he's seen that everyone is doing it now so he can't say it's specific anymore. And the general rule is if something uh, spreads far and wide to the point where you can't say it's for these people, then it becomes something that uh, there's no difference whether a Muslim is or a, or a, or a, uh, a legend to Daima, right? the permanent committee uh, of, uh, scholars, uh, the fatwa body in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they were asked about the tie, the tie. Is wearing the tie now Im imitating the non-Muslims? And they said, no, it isn't, because now everyone does it. So what do you learn from there? Maybe somewhere in the past, right, maybe pre-colonial colonial times, if the Bedouin Arabs saw a man wearing a tie, you know what, I want, then that would have been a problem. Does that make sense? But now that everyone is doing it. So you see how a rule can change from time to, to time. Based on this, based on this, is it possible that sometime in the future, it is said that the wearing of necklaces designed for men is something completely separate from women and to, to the point where, where it's not uh, imitation anymore, we'll see if that happens. But until that time, and that now is definitely not the time because we're still having that discussion, it's haram for you to wear a necklace because it's the imitating of the opposite gender. Is that clear? Tayyib. And what's the evidence that you're not allowed to wear it? We're not allowed to imitate the opposite gender. Tayyib. So, um, and that includes all types of, uh, of necklaces. Uh, and Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Um, a few other points that I want to discuss as it relates to uh, what we wear is things related to dyeing, dyeing your hair. What is the ruling of dyeing your hair? Um, because on the moment, this is, is libas and zina talked about. So, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Khalif al yahud wal nasara he said, um, differ from the Jews and the Christians. They do not dye their hair, dye your hairs. So, and, and when, when Abu Bakr's father, radiallahu anhum, anhuma, was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his hair was white and gray, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, غيرو, uh, غيرو, change it, change the color, or put henna on for him. And then in, some, in one riwayah, it mentions, وَجْتَنِبُ sawad And avoid black. Avoid black. طيب. So from this you learn that you are encouraged to change your hair, the color of it, but you must avoid what? Black. Some ulama, and this is the majority of scholars, this is what they say. So, um, again, someone asked me, well, Sheikh, if that's the case, can I make my hair blue or pink? Can I make my hair blue or pink? Based on the principles of imitation, the, um, we're not allowed to imitate the opposite gender. So men are not allowed to imitate women, women are not allowed to imitate men. B, we're not allowed to imitate the non-believers, or we're not allowed to imitate public sinners and promote, promotion, people that promote shar and evil. 
based on all of this, if someone were to say, I'm going to dye my hair pink, what would you guys say to him? Don't do it? Yeah, the Prophet said, change it and avoid black. I avoided black, it's pink. Ish al mushkila. Talha, what would you say? Why? Which, which principle do you feel like it's going against? Yes, it is something, Jazakallah khair. It is culturally seen as something that is barakallah uh, right? Culture, uh, we are meant, uh, and it can go against the one about um, not, uh, not bringing attention to yourself. Not bringing attention to yourself and standing out. This is not allowed, by the way. Some of the wisdom, do you know what some of the wisdoms is? Of not wearing clothes that, are, that stand out or looking in a way that stands out or having a haircut that stands out. It's called libas al shuhra and the Prophet prohibited it. Do you know one of the benefits from that is? One uh, is that uh, the people will speak about you and they may backbite you. And this is one of the wisdoms behind it. Honestly, if someone came and prayed in the masjid and he was wearing uh, pink hair and pink suit and I don't know, like huge, what a, we will all be looking at him weird, probably judging him and he would, he'd look different and he would draw attention to himself. All of this is not something that you want in, in, in Al-Islam. Does that make sense? So, you have to keep these things in mind. You're not allowed to go against the custom and the culture. You're not allowed to draw unnecessary attention to yourself. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to imitate the non-believers. You're not allowed to imitate public sinners. You're not allowed to imitate, what do you mean public sinners? And people that, Ibn, Ab, Ibn Abdul Bar, this great Andalusian scholar, he said uh, in the Tamheed, in his explanation of al Imam Malik, he said that he was talking about having your hair, wearing your hair long, growing your hair out. Growing your hair out. And he said, in my time, this is easily a thousand years ago, in my time, he said, the only people that grow their hair out are the fusaq. The only people are the people that are uh, uh, corrupt, corrupted people. So he was discouraging it. Now, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, Rasulullah himself had long hair. Many of the Sahaba had long hair. During the time of Ibn Abdul Bar, he's saying, now the people of the Fusaq are doing it, so we shouldn't do it. So sometimes a rule can change based on time and place. Does that make sense? A rule can change based on time and place. Um, so, dyeing the hair. There are some exceptions that the ulama gave, and there were some Sahaba that would dye the hair black. And the ulama discussed what was the reasoning. For example, Hassan and Hussein has been rated that they dyed their hair black. And some of the ulama have answers. They say, one, it could be that the hadith of the prohibition did not reach them. The hadith of prohibition did not reach them. And some say it was in the context of jihad. Because the, the fuqaha agree that it would encourage in the salaf to do this when they are going to war. The elderly men that had graying hair, they would tell them to dye it black because it would, uh, so that the opposing army don't feel more encouraged to fight when they think that there's only elderly men in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the army. So this was an exception. So they say it could be around that exception. And there is some kalam on the hadith about avoid black. But generally speaking, the ulama said we should avoid black. So brothers and sisters, you're not allowed to blacken your hair. But there's all these other types of hinna are allowed as long as you don't go against the adah and the custom. Like Dal Hasad, Barakallahu Feek. Tayyip. The other thing, we mentioned uh, silk. Uh, and that's only for sisters. We mentioned gold, which is only for sisters. Uh, speaking of hair, what are some of the uh, rulings related, related to hair for sisters? Number one, it is not allowed for them to shave their heads. It's not allowed for them to shave their heads. And you could argue that it can also come under the tashabuh bil rijal. Shortening the hair, the ulama said, would come under the, under the uh, custom rule. So in certain customs, the hair, the length of it, what's considered beauty, what is not. Of course, this is, goes back to the adah. But a lot of the ulama in the past would say she's not allowed to shorten her either. But some of the scholars would say they were, that was in their context. But now, uh, it, different cultures will have different rulings related to that. Hair extensions are absolutely not allowed. Hair extensions are not allowed. Uh, wigs, wearing a wig is not allowed except for uh, dire circumstances. And these are some of the rules related to hair for the sisters. And of course, their hair is aura. They are not allowed to show it. Um, طيب. Another thing that I want to speak about with regards to the brothers is what is known as isbal. Isbal is the garments. And many brothers, when they are, uh, they will wear their garments beneath their ankles. Beneath their ankles. And what is the ruling related to this? Uh, my brothers, uh, too often, too often, when we speak about uh, halal and haram, someone will say, Sheikh, 
how many opinions is in this particular view? I will say, well, there's a difference of opinion. And then your inclination is to take the easier view or to take the concept easy. But you know, instead of asking, is this halal or haram? The question should be, Ustad, Shaykh, Imam, what is the sunnah? What is better? This is the mindset that you have to be in. What is the sunnah and what is better? Tayyib. Because if we always speak about halal and haram and present the views, your heart will be like, oh, yallah, okay. Shaykh, is there khilaf in the issue of uh, making, turning, uh, using uh, black dye, hair dye? Yallah, yeah, there's khilaf in it. It's, uh, you know, some sahaba did, I'm going to do it. Is there khilaf in the issue of lowering your garment? There's khilaf in it. Yallah, I'm going to do it. Is there khilaf in the aura of this issue? I'm going to do it. Then all of a sudden, you'll become someone that is following the views that are lenient and easy, and this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. You need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there should be an element of fear in you and an element of I want to follow the rules Allah set in the best way possible. This is how we should be talking about it. Same thing goes for the beard and we'll discuss the beard in a second as well. طيب. The lowering of the garment. The lowering of the garment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in many narrations uh, the, uh, Allah will not look on the hereafter يوم القيامة uh, uh, among them was uh, three people, and among them was Al Musbiru Izarahu, Al Musbiru Izarahu, the one who lowers his garment beyond the ankles. For the men, of course. For the woman, it's encouraged. For the woman, is encouraged to lower her, her garments. For the men, is encouraged to raise her garment above their, above their ankles. So there were narrations where the Prophet ﷺ said, Ma asfari min al That which is below the, 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 the one that wears their clothes beyond the ankles is in the fire. Right. And there are many other narrations that mention the person that is in the fire is the one that does it out of arrogance, out of arrogance. So the scholars, they look at these narrations and many of them came to the conclusion that it is haram when you do it out of arrogance. The sin of fire is to do with lowering your garment out of arrogance. But if you're not doing it out of arrogance, then this, the sin is not on you. But some ulama said, no, these, are, these hadith are separate. Doing it out of arrogance is a sin within itself. Doing it generally is also a sin within itself. Right, so there is that view and there's this view. Now I could say to you, this one is stronger, most scholars said this one, I can say that to you, but I want to ask you the question. What is the sunnah of the Prophet Right, is it to lower your garments beyond your ankles or to raise them? And Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu, when he saw a young man, Sayyidina Umar, when, his, when he had a hole in his stomach, he was stabbed, and he is in his, on his deathbed, he said to a young man, Irfa' izarak, raise your clothes above your ankle. This is Umar on his deathbed. So it's not a, a matter that is not serious. But that being said, Lil Amana li ilmiya, for this, because we are here spreading the ilm and the scholarly views on this issue, many of the ulama said it is absolutely prohibited if there is a little bit of arrogance in you. And if there isn't, then they said, some said it's makruh, some said it's allowed. But I'm going to say to you here, hands down, my brothers and sisters, my brothers this time, my brothers, not the sisters, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. And don't just rely on the view of some of the ulama. But as for those that view, uh, it, the, the different views should stop you from um, disparaging, criticizing, you know, uh, refuting the person that, that uh, is, is uh, wearing their garments lower than their ankle if they uh, ask the imam and they hold the view that it is permissible. What you can do is remind them at an admonishment, tell them to fear Allah and remind them of the sunnah, but you can't just say you are involved in haram and you can't create this issue because there's a genuine khilaf in this issue. And when there's khilaf in this issue, we're not meant to create tafarruq and division among ourselves. But what is the safer view? To keep it above your ankle. What is closer to the sunnah? To keep it above your ankle. What is uh, that which uh, will save you in the fire, uh, from the fire 100%? Keeping it above your ankle. Did some ulama say it's to do with arrogance? Yes, they did. Are we being arrogant when we say, Yallah, I'm, I'm not being arrogant, Allah knows best. We just need to be careful as it relates to this. Another thing is the beard. What is the ruling of the beard for, them, for the brothers? Brothers, the beard is wajib. The growing your beard is wajib. And there is, uh, this is number one. Don't cut it. Shaving it is haram. Bil ittifaq. Shaving your beard is haram and there is no khilaf in this. 
They mentioned some of the Shafi'iyya. The later Shafi'iyya said, I have a view. But even the earlier uh, ulama from the Shafi'i school, they said it's not allowed. So shaving a beard is not allowed, right? And one can even argue that it goes uh, the, the principle of uh, imitating the non-believers whose culture it is to shave. Every morning they shave. So there's imitation involved in that. It could be imitating the woman because who doesn't have a beard? Sorry for the brothers that don't naturally grow a beard, uh, <laughs> right? And it's, uh, that's adi, you know, that's Allah's will. But um, purposively getting rid of it, it's like a lion removing his mane. What do you become? A lioness. And the Prophet ﷺ said in numerous hadith, leave the beard, wafiru liha. You know, and this is something that the ulama across madahib, across schools have said. They differed over the trimming issue. The trimming issue. And uh, some viewed that you shouldn't touch it whatsoever. Others said you can touch that which is beyond the qabda. Meaning, you hold the beard like this. You see how there's nothing coming here for me? So I can't touch my beard. But if someone else would grab their beard like this and there's hair coming out of here, they can cut, they can cut that. And there's some ulama that said that as long as you keep a semblance of a beard, this is fine. But again, I'm not here to tell you that this is the red line. I'm here to tell you the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ had a big beard to the point that the Sahaba could tell that he's reading Quran in the silent prayers because of the movement of his bed. They could tell. When the Prophet was leading the Salah, the silent prayers, they said, we could tell that he was reading, we could tell that he was reading because we could see his beard moving. If your beard can be seen when, you're move, when, you, when someone is facing away from you, that means, mashallah, you have what? A big beard. Right? And this is, of course, how it should be. And this is one of the things. I'll, I'll tell you something. Shaykh ibn Uthaymi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he died of cancer. And he was taken to America for chemotherapy. And he refused chemotherapy. He refused chemotherapy. And one of the reasons he refused was, he knew that, that his time was limited. He was old. And he had cancer. And then he asked the question. He said, am I, if I do chemo, going to lose all of my hair? Yes, you're going to lose all of your hair. Am I going to lose my bed? Yes, you're going to lose your bed. He said, I want to meet Allah with my bed. I want to meet Allah with my bed. And now you have brothers, they're shaving it, and there's no issue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify and protect us. Um, I'm jumping between the brothers and sisters because there's a lot to cover here. And uh, like I said, we're not going to be able to cover all of these little things. So brothers, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it relates to your beard. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it relates to your haircut as well. Your haircut as well, right? Don't imitate people of corruption, people of sin, people that are not believers. Don't imitate them. Sometimes, wallahi, there's imtihan. Brothers are gonna, uh, they, there's a football player that they like and they wanna immediately get his haircut. Yeah, akhi, have some higher uh, value for yourself, right? Right? If you're watching a game, khalay, yeah, don't, don't view these people as your role models. They're not. They are not. People that don't pray, don't believe in Allah, they can't be your role models. So, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. Speaking of football, what is the hukum of wearing clothing that have the cross on them? Certain football kits and certain teams, they have the cross. Don't wear those. Who can tell me one team who has the cross on their uh, crest? Barcelona, what did you say? Yes, okay, so now you know. Don't get yourself a Barcelona kit. I know a few, uh, yalla, a few fans of Barcelona are going to be a uh, sheikh. Um, but my question to you is very simple. How much does it bother you that people attribute a, 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 a son to God? Or they say Jesus is the son of God. How much does that bother you? Because it bothered the heavens to the point where it almost ripped apart. Allah says in the Quran, تَكَادُ السَّمَوَاتِ يَتَفَطَّرْنَ مِنْ وَتَنْشَقُ الْأَرْضِ وَتَخِيرُ الْجِبَالُ هَدَّى أَنْ دَعَوْ لِلرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدَى That the heavens and the earth ripped apart out of how heinous the statement was, when? And when they attributed a, a, a son to the Almighty. When Prophet Isa comes back, he will destroy the cross and break the cross. And you want to wear it on your chest? Because you like a football team? Because you like a football team? You want to wear it on your chest? How far have you fallen? How far have you fallen? Ya Sheikh, please, it's a... 
This is a problem, Allah. This is a problem. It gets worse. Some young men are playing football, and then he scores a goal, and he wants to celebrate like his favorite football player. Allah. And then they'll do the, the cross sign. You know guys what I'm talking about? How far have you have fallen? How far have you have fallen? That this doesn't bother us anymore. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and forgive us. Um, what about wearing clothes with a logo such as Nike? Nike shoes and, and uh, clothes, things related to this. And some could say that this has uh, to do with, uh, with uh, goddesses that used to be worshipped, right? Tayyip. To this, my brothers and sisters, I will say that we have to be practical in this matter. And some of the issues, uh, over time, it's not what comes to your mind immediately. When you hear, when you hear these brands, uh, Nike, and there are also uh, cars, right? Car companies that have their names, Mazda, and these things, the names, to go, it goes back to gods that used to be worshipped. But is that what comes to your mind? Is that what comes to your mind? No, it doesn't. And because of this, um, some of the ulama have said that it, the, the, um, the connection between the, the gods that they used to worship besides Allah and these brands is completely gone now. And because it's completely gone, there is some leeway in this regard. There's some leeway in this regard. But wallahi, I would dictate that you shouldn't do it. But to say it's haram, it would be very difficult because of all of these different brands. And the thing is, and it's, it, the, the days of the week, Monday, uh, it's named after a god they used to worship, uh, a moon god they used to worship. Thursday comes from uh, the Viking, uh, uh, the Vikings, and they used to worship the Nordic or the Nordic gods, uh, Thor, and all these things. But does that come to your mind when you say, "Let's meet on Thursday"? It doesn't come to your mind anymore. So these things disappeared over time, and because of that, there is some room to to allow this and to say. But again, if you avoid it, this is always better. And like I said, let's aim for higher. Let's not stick with Sheikh. Is it haram or halal? Don't tell me anything else. And this is the problem sometimes with fiqh. Halal and haram. If you stick in that just realm, we forget to aim higher. What is the sunnah? What is better? What is closer? Does that make sense, everyone? Barakallahu feekum. There's a lot that, that can be said, but if I can summarize a few points um, as it relates to the sisters, my sisters, the hijab is clear. Your aura has been made clear. You're not allowed to cover, cover, uh, uncover your aura in front of uh, uh, non mahrams. Fear Allah in this regard. Fear Allah in this regard. Don't show your hair. Don't adorn yourself. Don't put on uh, uh, things that beautify you unless it's in front of people that you're allowed to do so. Um, don't cause unnecessary attention to yourself. Ensure that you are dressed in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, just not the, what you wear, but also how you interact should be in accordance to Allah and his messenger. For the brothers, the same thing applies to you. Fear Allah in what you wear. When you're going to sports, when you go to the gym, the clothes that you are wearing, let them be clothes that are appropriate. Don't expose your hour necessarily. Be fearful with regards to your salah. The jeans that you're wearing, the trousers that you're wearing, right? The lower back is aura. Make sure that it's covered. Fear Allah has laced to you the jewelry. Sisters are allowed to wear jewelry. Brothers, don't wear gold jewelry or golden watches. And remember the sun as it relates to the, uh, the ring. Speaking of the ring, I know there's a lot to be covered. Uh, wedding rings. This is not from, from, from our deen. Wedding rings and look, you can gift uh, your spouse or your spouse to be a ring. You can do this. But the whole, till death to us apart, you wear this ring, you don't take it off. Someone was asked one time, Sheikh, uh, I, I, threw, I, I took my wedding off and I threw it on the ground. Is that a dalaq? Is that a dalaq? Like the significance you're attaching to this, where did it come from that you're attaching this ring to? This is not from us. We're not allowed to imitate the non-believers. We're not allowed to imitate the opposite gender. Sisters and brothers, both have to remember this. Um, and we are not allowed to stand out unnecessarily and cause attention to ourselves. Uh, and then we spoke about the sunnah for the brothers. As it is, the sunnah relates to the beard. Keep your beard, grow your beard. The sunnah is related to dyeing, avoid black. The sunnah is related to uh, jewelry, only silver. The sunnah that relates to your garments above your ankle. Inshallah ta'ala. The sunnah that relates to the color. Which color did we say is encouraged? Which color is encouraged? White. Barakallahu feekum. This, I think I said a lot. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to be able to cover the ahkam of libas and all of them. 
uh, as it relates uh, to brothers and sisters, this deserves a course. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, I have intention. And speaking of courses, um, Green Lane Academy of Sacred Sciences, Glass, is launching uh, its new year and many courses, and there's going to be an open day. Please visit our social media. And there's going to be many courses, including a course related to the Muslim dress code uh, at some point in the year. So I encourage you all to formally study your deen and attend those. Similarly, we're going to be having a conference soon uh, next week, inshallah ta'ala. Many mashayikh will be coming. Sheikh Abdullah al shuraika from Kuwait will be coming, and many other uh, local uh, du'at, imams, speakers, and, and scholars. Please ensure that you attend and benefit from that as well this coming weekend. And also register for the GLASS courses. GLASS stands for Green Lane Academy of Sacred Sciences. And uh, remember to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that you do. And uh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. I, I'm going to conclude here. And like I said, these were just some points of advice. But um, do you have a question? Don't what? Cleaning it up is fine. Cleaning it up and sorting it out is fine. Um, but uh, you know, you started, you started the questions. I'm already seeing hands going up now. May Allah, may Allah forgive us and protect us. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. But um, what's not allowed is, uh, what the scholars prohibited is the shaving and the trimming. There's some khilaf in trimming, but definitely shaving. And may Allah protect us in any case. But you should keep your beard, be proud of your beard, the beard is sunnah. Uh, tayyib. I'll conclude here then, inshallah ta'ala.